here we are back again. It's been almost three years or three years since we I had you here as a guest, and I can't believe the changes that have happened. Um, first and foremost, I think our our interview together generated over 150 thousand views which is probably the most watched video that I've had and wait, wait, wait. I probably the most watched <laughs> <laughs> and so we have a great report I was really excited to have you back on here Thanks, um, how uh, how are you doing I'm doing great um, I can't believe it's really been three years since we did that first video together uh, and uh, thank you by the way for that that's been it's something I show a lot of people as well because you are a fantastic interviewer oh. and it's a way of uh, getting people to be comfortable to talk to it. But a lot has changed. What has changed? So three years ago, when I was here last, I was the chief marketing officer of SAP, and now I'm the chief digital officer of SAP. But digital means something probably different than most people think. Mm. I'm gonna guess most people think digital marketing, but that's me. Uh, the other thing that's a big difference is, I think three years ago, we were talking mostly about the difference between B2B and B2C. And I think I pronounced that the difference was dead. Uh, we had a bit riff of that. And then you came out with a wildly popular book, H to H. So congrats to you as well. Starting with the title, there's no B2B or B2C. That's exactly so thank right. you for that. Oh, did you get that title actually from me? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a good time. And so, uh, so uh, we were talking about uh, human to human. We were talking about the differences between that. Also, social, social marketing and social transformation were things that we were talking about then. Yep. I think we're kind of past that I now. think that's true. I think there's still companies Many companies have figured out that if they're a B2B company, they have to act more consumer-like, so B2B2C maybe. Yeah. And maybe many B2C customers have recognized they have to use some of the techniques. Maybe we're halfway through that transition. Yeah. But what I'm actually most comfortable with in marketing is a lot of the adjectives we used to use in marketing, social marketing or social media marketing, digital marketing, have gone away because mm -hmm. it's just marketing. It's like the phone. We used to say the mobile phone, and it's just the phone now. We don't right. need the adjectives anymore. But of course, the word and the phrase that's hot right now, and maybe why many of the viewers think that I'm now chief digital officer is digital transformation. But the role is really different for a lot of people. And I don't know, you talk to a lot of people about digital as well. It means different things to different people. Right. Um, that is an excellent, uh, actually, lead in to something I wanted to ask you about. Okay. Because you have, you have trans, uh, transformed, changed basically your job role yes. since we met. You were the CMO of a massive company. 77,000 employees, yes. And, and and a massive budget. My background, for people that watched the first interview, they may remember if they're new, et cetera, is I'm an entrepreneur by background. I guess if I was better at marketing myself, maybe I'd call myself a serial entrepreneur, but I've been lucky enough to be the CEO of three Silicon Valley startups. The last one was acquired by SAP. That's how I got into SAP in the mm -hmm. first place. And I had a almost four year run as chief marketing officer of SAP from brand to demand, every product, every country worldwide. Fantastic job, I loved it. In fact, I may have even said in that interview, I have the best job on the planet. The challenge. Just to clarify real quickly, yeah. what kind of companies were these? These were? Uh, so these were analytics? technology companies, mostly based on analytics. Okay. Oh, you did your homework, you remember, yes. Uh, I used to joke that my phrase was better living through data. So I did one, one web analytics company, another dashboarding data company, one retail data company. So analytics companies, primarily software companies based here. Okay, great. Um, and while I loved my job, in the end, I like building things. Mm. And I don't remember exactly. Let's say it was 1,500 employees that were reporting to me around the world in 60-some countries. Um, that becomes more of an operational job than a building from scratch job. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the same as when you're five people in a garage, maybe with a dog, you know, with a new business plan. So I wanted to do something that was from scratch again. Mm -hmm. And in a very real sense, I view my role, head of SAP Digital, as my fourth startup. But instead of you know being in a garage and being funded by venture capitalists, maybe on Sand Hill Road, I'm in the SAP offices in Palo Alto, actually not so far from Sand Hill, and funded by SAP itself. Mm -hmm. And the general idea we're doing is in the same conversation that you and I had, I guess, three years ago, which is how do we make the entire SAP more consumer-like? My boss, Bill McDermott, calls me the direct-to-consumer business. Mm -hmm. So rather than just digitizing marketing, which I did a lot when I was CMO, mm -hmm. what would it mean to digitize sales? What would it mean to digitize accounting? What would it mean to digitize finance? What would it mean to digitize HR? What Could you build an entire end-to-end -end digital company? Mm -hmm. And so the mental model we have, in fact, our mission statement, because I think you have to have a mission statement when you start one of these things, mm -hmm. is we want to allow everyone on the planet, all seven and a half billion people, to be able to buy and to use an offering from SAP yeah. with minimal to no human intervention. So you shouldn't have to sign a purchase order. You shouldn't have to 
do contracts. You shouldn't have to negotiate contracts. You shouldn't have to hire a consultant to install. You should be able to go from wanting something to buying it to using it in under an hour. Let's go back to the H to H model. Okay. Because what you're describing is um, maybe different than what we were talking about then three years ago. Sure. Um, well, you can't get to evolve after three you years. Do you have to evolve. You do have to evolve for sure. Um, now, if you if you look at the digital transformation that you're talking about, um, is there human involvement at all? Yeah, of course. So let's back up. So digital transformation is a phrase that means many th things to many different people. And maybe what I should say, and, and I'll come back and answer your question in just a second, yeah. is people who have titles of chief digital officer have very different roles. So when I got the job, I don't remember, let's call it 15, 18 months ago, um, I did a little web search and said, how many other CDOs there are? Because I thought it was a pretty rare, and I could only find less than 30 of them. I think it was 27 or something like that. Uh, earlier this week, I had a, a buddy at work do the search, and we're well over 250. So the title has become very popular, and mm -hmm. I've been lucky enough to meet, I don't know, probably 50 of them in the last six or nine months. When I say, here's what I do, what do you do? Mm -hmm. There's almost no overlap. Mm -hmm. that, and so I kind of struggled of what is the role of a chief digital officer, mm -hmm. which will come back to your question about what digital transformation is. And it turns out the, the firm IDC, which you probably know, did an interesting study. I think they talked to like 80 or 90 different people with a CDO title, and they categorized them into three different kinds. Mm -hmm. So the most popular kind, Brian, I'm going to guess is the one that you probably thought I was, mm -hmm. which is the CDO is a digital marketer. Mm -hmm. They often, not always, but often report to the CMO. They sometimes report to the CIO, and right. their job is to think about social and web and communities and to digitize marketing, all the things that you and I talked about when I was here three years ago. That's That would be accurate. That's exactly what I thought. That would be accurate, then that's what you thought I was doing. Yes. That's not actually what I'm doing. In fact, that's there's somebody in my uh, old role that is doing that, doing a fantastic job. We're becoming more and more digital every month and every quarter, but that continues. So that's not me. Then there's a second kind of CDO, which I do a little bit of, but it's not my primary job as well, which goes by the phrase roughly digital evangelist. Typically, in a larger company, they're in a business unit. They report to the business unit lead. Sometimes they could report to the CEO or somebody in the executive team. Mm -hmm. But their job is to take a more traditional company that is maybe not digitally naturally mm -hmm. and help think of new business model innovation and new changes, how that company could think different. Often the wash word is, can you Uber us? Mm -hmm. Or something like that, because everyone loves to talk about it. Yeah. That person typically doesn't have much staff or much budget. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to cause change to happen by, I don't know, force of will, or they're, they're really nice people or something like that. Yeah. It's a hard job, but it's quite a popular job as well. Mm -hmm. That's probably the second most common one mm -hmm. of the three. Yep. The third one is what they call a digital general manager, or digital GM, I guess, for short. And I, I guess I'm a little bit of the second one, but I'm mostly this third one here. Mm -hmm. And their job is to build essentially an end-to-end -end business unit. And they're measured by revenue, by top-line performance. And they, and they typically say, figure out how we can get into new markets mm -hmm. or sell to people we've never sold to before or reconstitute our existing, and do something on the edge of the company but still connected to the company. And mm -hmm. we want you to actually run this thing end-to-end. -end. Mm -hmm. Those digital GMs are relatively rare still. Uh, there were 10 or 15 of them when I think this report was published. Maybe there are 30 or 40 of them now. Mm -hmm. But I think those are the ones that are going to become increasingly popular because it's a digital business mm -hmm. rather than just digital marketing. And this is applied to a certain size company that you're talking about. By, well. I think the study was, and I forget exactly, a thousand people and above. Mm -hmm. It's probably less true you're a small company. Right. In fact, one question which I don't know the answer to, which would be curious what your answer is, if you are a startup, do you need a CDO? Because you're probably digitally native. Right. My guess is you need CDOs and people think digital the larger that you are and the longer that you've been in business. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. It feels like every everything that we're doing right now, there is a digital sense to it. Having that knowledge and background is, you know, is, is uh, incredibly important. But when you're looking at, um, you know, this kind of model that you're talking about, it, it creates what I would think is a separation of, um, of, of, two, of one company into two. But then, how, but then there's some shared resources, and then there's shared, perhaps, sales and marketing. Is, is, that, is that accurate? So I guess it could be. Um, so let me give you two answers to that. Um, in my case, there is no salespeople. I'm trying to do digital sales. So digital sales is most likely done, perhaps, online in a very e-commerce way. 
So people would be able to buy from a website. You don't need us. Sometimes you might have an inside salesperson or a customer success rep if you do that. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any feet on the street. Mm -hmm. Traditional SAP sells primarily with feet on the street. We're phenomenally successful that way. Mm -hmm. um, some marketers run physical events. If you're a digital business, you don't really do physical events. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do webinars and other things like that, but you have to operate digitally as well. Right. Um, if you're a physical company, you do contract negotiation. There are usually attorneys that mm -hmm. redline contracts go back and forth. I, I don't do that. I do one-click agreements because that's what you'd expect digitally. I don't do purchase orders. Mm -hmm. I only do credit cards or PayPal. So if your mental model is all digital, mm -hmm. and if you're in a company that's traditionally not done digital, mm -hmm. There's some back-end infrastructure to share, but not the stuff that you'd expect. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, how did you, how did this come about? <laughs> um, so when I was CMO, one of the things that I was most passionate about was the science of marketing. We have long at SAP been phenomenal at the art of marketing. Mm. Um, many of the people who watch this will know the SAP campaign that's been in places like airports. It's hard to miss them. We've had the run campaign for a long time. We've had many incarnations of it run better than that had to run simple. You'll see a new one coming out at our customer event called Sapphire in May of this year as well. Mm -hmm. That part of the brand, some companies like to call that big M marketing, has always been in our DNA. We're good at it. Mm -hmm. We are, weren't always good at the science of marketing, of really understanding attribution model and analytics and funnel. I know some people like to say the funnel is dead and how do you do It's not dead. Thank mm -hmm. you for saying that. Yeah. Uh, it's just different than it used to be. It's, just, right. it's, it's alive. You can do the voice, it's alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we hadn't spent a lot of time, and it wasn't in our DNA to do that science part. So a lot of what I spent my roughly four years of being CMO is helping us do art and science together. Because even if we had done them, they were done independently. And art and science always have to come together. It shouldn't be an and. Mm -hmm. It should be an and, not against. Mm -hmm. In doing that, I realized that no matter how much time I spent digitizing marketing, if the rest of the company wasn't synchronized and often digitized, it was going to be hard to prove the impact. Mm -hmm. If you do all your time doing last touch attribution and optimizing the funnel, at the very end you have to hand over to a salesperson, and that salesperson has you know a few minutes to decide whether they want to follow up on that lead, or talk to somebody at golf, or go to an event, that, that's the wrong way to run a business. Mm -hmm. If you can. And then if that then turns into, as I said, signing a physical contract, negotiating that for you, you can't speed up the entire company by just doing it in marketing. Right. So I pivoted from being what I'd say being very deep in one discipline mm -hmm. to now being across every discipline. And do you miss marketing? Of course, I love marketing. Yeah. Um, marketing is the heart of everything we do. Um, but what, what I like now is I grew up as a product person. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the go-to-market side, and marketing was sort of in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of this job is, as an entrepreneur, I get to do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So I can still go in and look at SEO and see how we're doing on particular keywords. I can mm -hmm. still uh, test, A-B test particular phrases to see whether, so I still do some marketing, mm -hmm. but now I get to do some sales, and I get to do some product development, and I get to do some, I get to do a lot, so I, I like that. I'm, I'm, I like the a new challenge every day, mm -hmm frankly, a new challenge every hour of every day. <laughs> so do I miss it? Sure. But do I love my current job? I, say, I used to say I had the greatest job in the entire world. Now I realize that now I have the greatest job <laughs> in the entire world. I can't wait to talk to you in three years. Then I'll have another one. <laughs> so um, um, let's talk about the culture changes that need uh, to happen and how digital transformation affects culture or how you work with the culture to build something like this. You know, when I go meet other CDOs, um, and I always think, well, they may want to talk about business process change, or they may want to talk about technology. What's the latest tool that you're using? It's almost never the truth. Mm -hmm. every, I don't want to say every, because I'm sure I'm exaggerating, but virtually every conversation is, how do you get companies to change? What are the culture issues? I mean, everyone knows that phrase that I've loved for the last decade or so, which is culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So they all know that culture is the most, but they don't know how to change it. Right. And frankly, we struggled with it for a bit as well. Because mm -hmm. we believed all the things that we saw written by, uh, well, we won't say who they're written by, that the only way to cause change is to do it on the edge and take your most creative people and have them hide out in Silicon Valley and keep them away from the culture, the sorry, the corporate antibodies and all that. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is they never get scale. They can be innovative, but they never change the company. Mm -hmm. So what we've done now is taken this and done it within. We take those that we think will be most resistant to change and say, help us figure out how this has to scale. 
Uh, we have them do six month sabbaticals on our teams as well. And in the last, again, roughly 18 months, mm -hmm. we've identified six mindset issues that get in the way of actually changing the culture. We've, we've identified six mindsets that you have to mm -hmm. have to be more digitally affluent and more digitally comfortable. And I won't go through all six, but let me just give you two as sort of a feel. The first one is hands-on. Mm -hmm. Now, what I, I mean, we all know what the word hands-on means, right? To do it yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you're at a big company, Maybe this even happens at Pure Matter, I don't know. But if you're in a big company and you run into a tough problem and you don't know how to solve it, the first reaction is almost always go find a consultant. Go find an expert that knows how to do this. And I don't mean to be negative to consultants. There are wonderful consultants out there. Right. But if you outsource all your tough problems to somebody else, yeah. you never really learn. And so we've said, nope, we've got to flip it on their end. Our first reaction has to be to try and do it yourself, even if you have no idea what you're doing even if you're guaranteed not to get it right, and you fail. So we, we we make a lot of mistakes. If I were to guess, I make, I make 50 times more mistakes in my team in this job than we did in the last team. Mm. But we have to have a much higher tolerance for making mistakes and learning. So that hands-on is something that not everyone's comfortable with. There are a lot of people that are used to just directing others to doing something and not trying to do it themselves. That is critical for digital transformation. If you don't mind, it means that there's a second issue. Mm -hmm. And here's where I've made a bunch of mistakes as well. So actually, I'll, I'll give you a failure, which is mm -hmm. we live in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley glorifies the term failure. You're, you're every, there, we used to have this event here called FailureCon, I think it was, mm -hmm. which was an event about how to fail. And we tell, there's all these books about fail fast and do this, et cetera. Is that event still around? I think it failed. Hmm. Interesting. Huh, get, get what I did? No, actually, I think, it was so, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was so successful it couldn't exist anymore is really what they say. I, um, Interesting. Uh, but... So I preached when I first showed up to this large, successful company, we need to fail more often, we need to make these mistakes. And boy, that was a really bad idea. Because culturally, big companies don't tolerate failure. They're built to withstand things that are gonna cause them to bring them down. That's mm -hmm. what, cultural antibodies are there for a good reason, not a bad reason. If the company is wildly successful, mm -hmm. anything that threatens its existence, just like a foreign body in your human, mm -hmm. should be, that, so they go, the, the antibodies come up and say, we're gonna get rid of this foreign body, if right. they're successful. If they're weak, that's a different story entirely. So what I realized is the way I was evangelizing failure was actually causing people to resist it even more culturally. Mm -hmm. So I switched my vocabulary and my style. And I said, you know what, you're right. We don't want failures. What we want is a culture of experimentation. Instead of making a small number of big bets, mm -hmm. we want hundreds of little bets. Mm -hmm. So you can use scientific experiments mm -hmm. as an analogy of what we do, which is you know, if it used to take six months to get something to market or a year or a quarter, why not next week? Mm -hmm. Why not try 30 things simultaneously and see which ones work mm -hmm. rather than one thing, et cetera? And that mindset set of mind shift mm -hmm. set of going to, oh, I want to constantly experiment. Mm -hmm. I want to try things. And when they don't work, stop them. Didn't fail. Mm -hmm. Just stop the experiment once you have evidence. Mm -hmm. Have some more theory, et cetera. Has been wild, much better. Yeah. So I've stopped preaching failure. Yeah. It really felt like preaching to a lot of people mm -hmm. and switched to a mindset of experimentation. Well, you know, it's very much like a startup because a startup is uh, ask first, ask the customer what they want, yep. um, implement, try it, fail, change it up, try it again. You're right, Brian, but here's the reality. We aren't all startups. I mean, I ran three startups. When you're a startup, you have no existing processes, so mm -hmm. you can invent on the fly. When a startup, you have no existing customers so you can go recruit on the fly. Mm -hmm. When you have startup, you don't yet have a board that is looking for mm -hmm. whatever. You don't have quarterly filings to the street. You don't have a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And so your tolerance for risk can be higher mm -hmm. because the only people you're disrupting are probably outside your company. Mm -hmm. You're not disrupting yourself. Right. When you're doing digital transformation, the disruption you're doing isn't really to a competitor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is, but it's normally to your existing business model. And companies don't like disruptions to their existing business models. So, so just um, kind of dovetailing back into the the cultural shift, how does that affect SAP employees that are used to building up a product, releasing it versus iterating as they go? How how is that shift? So, there's a couple of things you can do, and we could probably spend the next eight hours of film telling it. But one of them is ask yourself whether return on investment is really the right way to measure success. Now, ROI is one of these things that's so deep in culture lore as the right thing to do. Right. We might even talked about marketing ROI when I was here last time. I don't remember. We did, yeah. And I've come to the conclusion ROI is cause of most of the problems. Wow. And the reason it is, is we built these silly spreadsheets 
which are based on assumptions that never really come true, and use that to say, oh, this is a 2x, or this is a 3x, and this is the timeline. And because we're so scared, ROI cut th through, we don't want to take many risks. Mm -hmm. So we wait longer to launch, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I've started wondering whether the right measure, and I don't have this one down yet, is something about time to market, mm -hmm. or time to feedback, or number of iterations or something. Yeah. And th there's an old quote, which I'll butcher, because I butcher quotes all the time, but I'll get it just <laughs> right, which is, I think in the Sun Tzu thing, which is, mm -hmm. no battle plan to ever survive contact with the enemy. And I adopt that to say no business plan, no marketing plan, no mm -hmm. launch plan ever survives contact with the customer, even if the customer is involved, because mm -hmm. you can't involve a thousand customers. And so I'm now all about get something out soon, mm -hmm. even if it's only 50% or 60%. Now you could call that minimum viable product, but I, don't, I think it's more than that. Okay, uh, great segue to customer experience or just huh. experience in general. Is that bus race still happening now? It is m happening in a major way, okay. in my opinion, um, uh, if not in Silicon Valley, throughout the, the world in terms of what customer experience looks like and how you're designing the path and yeah. what's the customer journey and like all these different things. So what you're saying is, is that the, uh, well, Actually, instead of putting words in your mouth, well, why, why don't you tell me? Why, tell me what you think about the the experience? Because you're talking about a whole different path, I think. I am, but I actually almost there got just quick roles, and I could interview you. That would have been very interesting. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that next time. I almost went there. But. <laughs> almost did that. So look, um, here's my somewhat contrarian view on this. So if I look back over the last five, one could argue ten years, many brands, many companies have recognized that they can't compete on price or features anymore. That's become more and more popular. And so how are they gonna compete? How are they gonna differentiate themselves from the competition? It's gonna be the experience. And the reason there's been so much writing and consternation and investment in customer journeys and experience, all very valid, is if I can't compete on price or features or it's harder and harder to compete, then I have to compete on something else, which is differentiation to the customer, that's the experience. And I think that's fantastic, that's worked well, it's why customer experience has become a boardroom discussion topic, and it's why you hear so much about it. And look, here in the Valley, the canonical example of that is the iPod. Yeah. The iPod probably was not the most technical marvel compared to other MP3 players at the time. For sure, it wasn't the lowest priced one. Sure. But the integration with iTunes changed the experience that people had, and they were willing to pick up this device, which by now is great, but back then was very early on, mm -hmm. not because of the price or because of the features, because of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think is interesting is that people missed the real revolution. Yes, the experience was great, which is why consumers bought it. Mm -hmm. But what really happened is it changed the music industry. And the way it changed the music industry, in my opinion, is we went from album-oriented to song-oriented. Mm -hmm. We went from, I don't know, maybe you're roughly my age, Dark Side of the Moon had to be listened song by song, and right. you were not allowed to change that order yeah. to, I don't know, you listen to songs in any order and mashup tapes or whatever you do. In fact, no one talks about album-oriented rock or any of that stuff anymore. Right. It's just songs and hits. Yeah. And while that changed, that experience is what changed the music industry, it didn't really change their business model. Now, what do I mean by that? Is a song was, at the time, $1.40, and I think it's 99 cents now. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted every song in the album, it still cost you the same $15 that an album costs. Right. And roughly, negative press aside, people still got paid in the same way people got paid. So that was not a business model change. What I see now is that people are recognizing that only changing the experience without also changing the business model means you didn't really digitally transform, coming back to the way we started. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing now is business model innovation, mm -hmm. business transformation, where you actually change how you make money, how you get paid, mm -hmm. et cetera, that's where all the people are moving to. Mm -hmm. You can still do experience, but you have to do that. So we'll come back to music industry. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a fan, and for any of my Apple friends that may be watching this, I'm not being negative, I'm a fan of Spotify. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is- Me too. Oh, you too. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so there you go. So they can not like us as much. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me about Spotify is I don't buy music. Mm -hmm. I don't rent music. I don't know if you've thought about it very much, because I didn't for a while, is you're paying to access a library of music. You're paying for access rights. And the minute you stop paying, you own nothing. Right. It's not like iTunes. When you download the song, you have rights to the song, and you can give me, you, you, you don't own anything. There's no ownership, rental, buying, yeah. et cetera. And that business model change of, I don't know, $10 a month or 20, depending on what term you're on, and having, is something that I think will suddenly 
end up with many different businesses. Mm -hmm. Imagine an Uber where you pay $100 a month for unlimited rides. Right. Imagine, just roll through that. Imagine a software industry for, yeah. et cetera. And Health and fitness, um, it, it just keeps going. That's yeah. right. So I, I, people talk about we've gone to a rental economy. Mm -hmm. I think that misses, we're getting to an access economy, which is different than a sharing economy. Mm -hmm. And even Apple, which everyone regards as the king of experience, one could argue that one of the reasons that they launched Apple Music was because they recognized that business model innovation as well. Mm -hmm. So back to your question, those brands that are only thinking about the experience have to be careful that they didn't just change the, a better experience on a broken business model that hasn't fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. That you have to business model change first and then build a new experience for that business model. Mm -hmm. A taxi cab company couldn't become Uber. You have to right. change the business model first and then the experience. So uh, off camera, we were talking a little bit about gaming. Yes. And how gaming uh, has this model of micropayments. Indeed. Um, and how these these kinds of transformations are now happening outside of industries like gaming that have been taking you know place for years. So people sometimes say to me, what kind of digital transformation could you do at SAP? I mean, you guys are a well-established 44-year-old company. Depending on how the stock market closed today, we're roughly a 100 billion euro company, yep. 100 billion dollar company. And one of the examples I gave you off camera, which says, look, I, I like to look outside enterprise software for inspiration of how we could disrupt ourselves. I'm not a gamer, um, I, I, and so, but I've studied a lot of how gamers interact. And the example you use is pretty interesting, which is you don't typically sell the entire game. Mm -hmm. You give a no cost, notice I didn't say free, or a limited cost version of the game. And as you get more used to it, then you can say, you want another map for a dollar, or do you want some more guns if it's a shoot 'em up game, or et cetera, or whatever your game is as you explore. Mm -hmm. And over time, you still may get the $20 for the game, mm -hmm. but you reduce the barriers of adoption by asking for very little upfront, maybe mm -hmm. just a dollar or even nothing. Mm -hmm. So the question I ask myself is, why couldn't software and other goods work that way as well? Mm -hmm. If you think about how you buy any kind of software, whether it's the desktop software that you have, mm -hmm. or more enterprise software, Typically you say, well, how many users do, you th do I think I really will need? Hmm, I think I'll need 40 users, maybe I'll say 50 just to be on the safe side. And do I really need all these features? Well, if I, if I get all the features and if I get all the users, I can probably get a better discount from my favorite software vendor, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's SAP, but there are other software vendors mm -hmm. out there. So I'll, I'll buy a lot early on, get a nice discount and go. And then you spend the next month or six months. That's perfectly bad. It's a good valid model for many companies. Mm -hmm. But if you're a smaller company, if you're more entrepreneurial, if you're a division and you're not ready to do that, mm -hmm. why not flip that on its tail? Why not have something that's more of a, I don't know what I need. Mm -hmm. Why not, and, and if, if you don't know what you need, then maybe the software should just show you what you need as you go along. Mm -hmm. You're using the product, it says, hmm, this extra feature would allow you to be more efficient. Why don't I turn this on for you? You didn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm explain to you how you could use it in the product yourself, let you use it for some 30 days or something like that. In that model, when you turn things on, you get charged more, and when you turn things off, you don't have to pay for them as well. And mm -hmm. so people would be much more comfortable to experiment with software, yeah. knowing they would only have to pay for what they really need, rather than what they think the mental model is, I'm not right. sure, I better buy insurance and have it all. And not have to call somebody and go through contracts. Exactly right. And figure out who owns the contract right. and the whole process to do that. To be fair, once you buy, you don't remember it. Do I call this person or that person? Yeah. If the software just became the salesperson, right. and the software became the marketer, and the software became the support person, yeah. not that I'm trying to get rid of humans, because there's still some times yeah. when you want to talk to humans, it would make your life easier. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be that support. So um, now, I'm just going to pivot a little bit okay. because you've put together this incredible um, idea or this concept here, kind of merging together a different variable, different variations of this uh, position and um, a, a component to the company that they hadn't been doing before, yeah. working with the company, obviously, to, to put that together. For sure. Yes. Um, and in doing that, you've been able to travel the world to kind of build this whole machine. Um, my question is, how do you see, as you're traveling around the world, how do you see, um, you, you know, you look at Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is dirt, certainly known for its its innovation and technology and things that we're talking about right now. 
Do you see that growing? Do you see it changing in anywhere else in the world? How, how, how is it? I mean, it's obviously there's epicenters like this, yep. but nothing like it. There's nothing quite like Silicon Valley. As much as people like to call them Silicon something, it's still different. So I do get to travel a lot and uh, a little bit less in the last year or so, but I think two years ago I was in 20 countries that year or something like that. Um, and I think I was ta- was every time I'd message you, you were in a different co- it, country. It, it could be. Yeah, you're, you're, you're making me feel <laughs> bad. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, living here in Silicon Valley and being here for 20 years, sometimes you can forget how much of a bubble we live in. Uh, things that we just take for granted in Silicon Valley, even something as almost ubiquitous as, U- as Uber, doesn't immediately happen every place on the planet, and therefore outside of Silicon Valley, even in some places in the U.S., there's a, often a healthy skepticism that some of these transformations are really going to take hold. They're viewed as, maybe to use the language I used before, interesting experiments. So I was recently uh, at a, um, a large event called CBIT, uh, which is in Germany. It's held every year. I think at one point it was the largest trade show in Europe. I'm not sure if it really is. Think sort of like Comdex, but in Europe as well. And when I was there, I got to talk to, I don't know, 10, 15 or so other European CDOs. And I was wondering about this and I said, where do you guys think we are on the digital transformation journey of your industries? Are we, and I unfortunately used a baseball metaphor, baseball doesn't play that well in Europe, so maybe we should have used a soccer metaphor or something like that, or sorry, football metaphor if I'd done that as well. Are we relatively early on? Are we middle stages? Are we late stages? And I think if you asked the average West Coast exec, Mm -hmm. they'd say we're well in the middle, maybe even late stages of these transformations happening. And it was my surprise that they said, we we agree that this is inevitable, but I think we're very early on. We'll still be talking about digital transformation in another decade. Mm -hmm. And my own bias is, I'm not sure that's true. I I wonder whether the title chief digital officer will even exist in five years. Mm. So um, do you have a new title in mind? Uh, I, I don't, although <laughs> that would be terrible because my boss might want to say, no, I'm just um, I, There is one sort of trend that I'm wondering about, and it's, I don't think it's necessarily anything to do with me, which is the, the acronym CDO, and I'm not a big fan of acronyms in the first place, no offense to H to H, um, but sometimes CDO means chief data officer, mm-hmm. sometimes CDO means chief design officer, user experience, sometimes CDO means chief digital officer, that's my official title, or head of SAP Digital. Uh, Although I get joked at, some of my colleagues say I really am the chief disruption officer. Mm. And I wonder if those four things come together in some way. Mm. And I don't know what the title will be, maybe it's just CDO, the acronym. But I do think data and digital and design and disruption are four pivots of a similar idea. And maybe it's one title someday, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the overarching theme here um, that I'm seeing is really data driven (laughs) and the data that is flowing through everything that you're talking about in digital, in design, in analytics. And the data that's coming through at the end of the day, the analytics is what's telling the story. And that story is something that personally, I don't believe, and I'd like to hear what you 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 think too, is is how it's being told. What are we getting from the data? How are we, move, how are we innovating? How are we moving things along? The yeah. story is just not being told as well as it can without, you know, an, an, a real high level MBA or even higher, you know, a very smart person, let's call it, yep. to be able to interpret that and move that into something that's actionable, that's going to result in ROI. I agree. How do we you get there? Right. I know I did. Yeah, I know. Well, you said HH. I did. So, yeah. um, so, so when we get to wh- where, we, where do you see us going? How's this going to get better over the next few years? You're asking me to predict the future, aren't you? I am. This is this is my favorite question of all time. Asking you right now. Okay. Ready? I'm putting you on the spot. Um, so look, as marketers, we need to get better storytellers, and as data people, we need to get better at the story of data. No arguments there whatsoever. Violent agreement. And. Uh, I think you know this, my startups I've done, I think I'm a data slash analytics guy by background. That's in my DNA. I used to say my mantra was better living through data science. But um, what's happened in my point of view is 10 years ago, there was still data. It wasn't called big data, it wasn't called data science, but it was maybe 1% of a company that knew how to use the technology and tools to wrangle the data in such a way that they go, aha, look at this report. And that's how BI or decision report got popular. And in the last five years, there have been more and more self-service tools that have kind of popped up. We have one of our own as well, but 
really it's still only gone from like 1% to 5%, depending on whose numbers you can believe. The vast majority of people still don't have access to ask questions from data for themselves. Mm -hmm. They still rely on a centralized or distributed team. And I, I think until self-service, and again, I don't want to get hung up in the word, but self-service ask your own data question gets mm -hmm. ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And ubiquitous probably means 51%. doesn't have to be everybody. We have a fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we will get there relatively quickly. I think that's some of the coolest technologies I see in data discovery and are, are now making it so even people that have no MBA or no data science can start doing real mm -hmm. things. What I'm hoping for the next breakthrough, and I, I get to talk to a lot of interesting startups and I see some technology in my own company as well, is even when you get that aha, you often don't know what to do about it. And so while we've done a decent job of going from data to analytics, we've done a terrible job of going from analytics to action. And closing the gap from the, I've discovered this weird anomaly has happened in the data, to now what, mm -hmm. is I think the next big frontier. And, and when, that'll sort of close the loop all the way back to what it was originally called, which was decision support. Right. We don't really have a lot of good tools for supporting the decision. We have lots of really good technology for analyzing and storing and massaging the data. I'm hoping that's what happens in the next decade.